from the theatre of war to the theatre of memory. Along the old front line, but also in every parish back home, are the now familiar monuments to the dead of 1914-18. Every year we observe solemn and moving rituals. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. But for those of us now who didn't live through the Great War, what are we remembering? A terrible sacrifice. And for what? In Britain, the usual answer is for nothing. We tend to think of the Great War as pointless slaughter, mud and blood, the carnage illuminated only by poignant war poetry. But I think that mentally we have become stuck in the trenches. Our view of 1914-18 is now a caricature. In this series, I want to get out of the trenches and look afresh at the impact and meaning of the conflict in Britain and across the world. There's a strange paradox about the Great War. For us now, it's a static, futile and inconclusive conflict. Yet I want to explore how this deadlocked war unleashed huge, dynamic forces that have pummeled and shaped the whole century since 1914. One of the biggest legacies is our memory of the Great War, the story we tell ourselves about it. This isn't something fixed in stone, it's shifted repeatedly over time. And different countries remember the Great War in different ways. Above all, the contrast between the memory of 1914-18 in Britain as against Germany would really matter in the years that followed. This film is about how the Great War has cast shadows over the whole century since 1914, and how, equally important, the events of that turbulent century have cast shadows over the way we remember the Great War. In 1918, the British Commonwealth forces started to return from France. Yet most people had little sense of what soldiers had been through in body and mind. From the start, it was hard to come to terms with the enormity of the Great War. In the quiet moments of the night, when the wind blew in the right direction, it's said that you could hear the low rumble of the guns on the Western Front here in Britain. But even if people might be able to hear the war, they couldn't see it and they struggled to imagine it. That, I think, is a deep paradox about the Great War. It was the biggest conflict in British history, 720,000 dead, a million and a half wounded. And yet the reality of warfare remain distant and obscure. So the British entombed the unknown horrors in grand monuments graced with fine words like honour and sacrifice. Memory was cloaked in remembrance. In July 1919, Veterans marched through London in a victory parade. To allow them to salute the memory of their dead comrades, the architect Sir Edwin Lutyens was commissioned to build an appropriate monument. Tellingly, what he came up with was not a traditional victory arch, but a tomb, in fact, an empty tomb, the cenotaph. 
At first a temporary structure of wood and plaster, and then in November 1920, made permanent in stone. One and a quarter million people filed past in the first week. The memorial stood 10 feet deep in flowers. For a nation numbed by grief and uncertainty about the war, the appeal of the Cenotaph lies, I think, in its simple yet abstract character. Lutchen's design was, in effect, an empty space onto which people could project their own memories and emotions. While the Cenotaph allowed the British people to remember the war in their own way, the British state took control of the dead. Politicians refused to bring soldiers' bodies back. The cost would be prohibitive, and anyway, many men had been literally blown to bits. Instead, the bodies of British and Commonwealth soldiers were carefully collected along the Western Front, buried with reverence, and canopied with striking architecture. The interwoven arches Lutchens designed at Teepfarm were not to trumpet victory, but to bear 72,000 names of the missing of the song. The new Menin Gate at Ypres was inscribed with a further 55,000 names. And these were just two of nearly a thousand more cemeteries and memorials, today still maintained by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The project was the brainchild of Fabian Ware, who at 45 in 1914 was too old to fight. Volunteering instead as an ambulance driver, Ware was appalled by the random carnage. He became determined that each soldier, whether a general or a private, a Canadian or an Australian, should have his own named grave. Very different from the mass graves into which the soldiers were dumped a century earlier, after the Battle of Waterloo. Helping Ware to design the gravestones was another man too old to fight. The poet Rudyard Kipling had especially guilty memories. He pressed his only son, Jack, to join the army. Jack was last seen stumbling in agony across the battlefield of Luz, with half his face blown off. His body was not found. For those like Jack who were forever missing, Kipling coined the phrase, known unto God. Today, the project of state-imposed remembrance, spearheaded by Lutchens, Ware and Kipling, seems extraordinary and impressive. But at the time, this was enormously controversial. Parents wanted to mourn their sons at home in their own country churchyards. The standardised headstone was denounced as a Prussian imposition. One mother complained that the tombstones looked like so many milestones, but the project was pushed through by old men in London who had sent the boys to war and were now contorted by grief and probably guilt. This was the survivors saying on a grand scale, sorry. The British had buried the dead with honour. They had created rituals to remember, but also to sanitise the war. And it seemed that life could get going again. For a new generation who'd come of age after the war, the 20s were a time of new music and new fashions. They had been too young to fight and were quite happy to forget the Great War to consign it to history. But the past has a way of biting back. 1928 was the 10th anniversary of the end of the war. The media then and now love anniversaries as a source of cheap and easy stories. But these 
often generate deeper discussion about the meaning of the past. 1928 was just such a trigger. Private grief began to enter public debate. A succession of new books and memoirs took the wraps off the soldiers' experiences in the trenches and gave voice to their enduring pain. But more than anything, it was a play that brought home to the British people something of the hellish reality of the Great War. The author was R.C. Sheriff, who'd served as an officer on the Western Front and then, it seemed, returned to normal life as a shy insurance clerk living with his parents in suburban Surrey. Yet, like many veterans, Sheriff struggled to cope with his war experiences. And 10 years on, they came to the surface as theater. Journey's End was set in a gloomy dugout with soldiers sitting around, talking, bickering, and using drink to numb their emotions and keep them going. War imagined against a stone memorial was one thing. The dead brought to life on stage was very different, and Sheriff was terrified about how his play would be received by the audience. The performance ended in what Sheriff called an eerie and unreal silence. The cast took their bow while a thousand faces just stared back. No clapping, no reaction, nothing. The curtain descended again as if on a two. And then the cheers erupted. It was the start of a West End run that lasted 18 months. The reviews were glowing, praising above all the realism of the play. But others saw a deeper meaning interpreting Journey's End as a stark warning for the future about the horror of war. The author J.B. Priestley wrote of the play, it is the strongest plea for peace I know. Today, that reaction to Journey's End as a plea for peace may seem to us rather pathetic, even tragic, because we know with hindsight that in 1939, the world was plunged into another great war. For us, the 1920s and 1930s are the interwar years. But we have to remember that for the people who lived through them, they were the post-war years when the future still seemed open and even hopeful. The great hope was never again, that 1914-18 would be in the cliché of the time, the war to end all war. Britain's payoff for the great war had to be the great peace. In the 1920s, this yearning for peace was focused on a new international body, the League of Nations, based in neutral Geneva. One of its key architects and champions in Britain was another guilt-ridden man who'd been too old to fight. Robert Cecil was the son of Tory Prime Minister Lord Salisbury. He grew up here at Hatfield House, part of a family that had served the British state since the days of the first Queen Elizabeth. Cecil was a man of the establishment, but he was also an instinctive reformer with a deep Christian conscience who loved to campaign for unlikely causes. He championed votes for women, but he was equally passionate about the dangers of the motor car. As president of the Pedestrians Association, he helped to bring in the driving license and the 30 mile an hour speed limit in town. 
But what Cecil really wanted to put the brakes on was war. Cecil was haunted by memories of the Great War. In 1914, he'd worked for the Red Cross in France, helping the wounded. Like Ware, he was appalled by the destruction. But after 1918, his eyes were not on the dead and the past, but on the living and the future. If there is a quarrel between two individuals, they do not fight it out unless they are barbarians or schoolboys. Cecil was an idealist with a highly moral view of international affairs. For him, the League of Nations was the essential machinery, as he put it, to prevent states from going to war. In other words, stopping another 1914. And that meant no more secret deals between an international mafia of aristocratic diplomats. Instead, democratic decisions open to public gaze. And if rogue states didn't settle disputes through talking, then sanctions or even force could be used against an aggressor. And the League soon made a difference. In 1914, the Great War had exploded out of a little Balkan crisis. In 1923, there was another dangerous flare-up in the Balkans, between Italy and Greece. In retaliation for the murder of some Italian soldiers, Italy's new dictator, Benito Mussolini, occupied the island of Corfu. The League intervened, imposed a fine on Greece, and persuaded Mussolini to withdraw his troops. For the British, Corfu was a positive sign that the League could stop 1914 happening again. But in Germany, a very different way of remembering and understanding the Great War was taking hold. For Germany, what mattered was not preventing another 1914, but another 1918 the year of humiliating defeat. That autumn, German soldiers were still fighting in France when the government fell apart and the capital Berlin became a political battleground between right and left. So much so that the constitution for the new German Republic was hammered out 200 miles away in Weimar. Weimar was a sleepy provincial town, but also the historic heart of German culture. Home to Bach, Schiller and Goethe. The creation of the Republic here in Weimar was a calculated attempt to root the new democratic Germany in all that was best in the country's past but it was also a panic measure, forced on Germany's politicians by the street violence gripping Berlin. The Weimar Republic would never escape the bitter controversy in which it was born. In July 1926, an obscure right-wing party held its annual rally in Weimar, and its leader delivered his keynote speech equally deliberately in the National Theatre. He was taking command of Germany's past for a very different purpose. The party leader had fought on the Western Front, and his version of Germany's war echoed that of many fellow veterans. The German army had not been defeated in 1918. It was still fighting heroically on foreign soil, only to be stabbed in the back by the Reds and pacifists at home. The Weimar Republic had then sold out by accepting the vindictive peace terms of the Treaty of Versailles, a point that he rammed home on the very spot where the Republic had been founded. This was very different political theatre from Journey's End. 
Hitler's speech celebrated Germany's centuries-long struggle to become a great power. Then he turned in fury to the Great War. The whole world was against us. On the battlefields of France, Belgium, Russia, the Ukraine, in the south and on the high seas. And now, now we are a ridiculously small splinter of a country, like Poland, Serbia, Croatia. No! Hitler lusted to make Germany a world empire once more. It was a far cry from never again. More like, bring it on. Nazi members held rallies in Weimar and other German cities. Many of them war veterans turned paramilitaries. This was a total contrast with the veterans of the British Legion, armed only with poppies. In 1926, Hitler was a fringe politician, but his spin on the memory of the war struck a chord with many ordinary Germans. In the devastating economic depression of the early 30s, Hitler was able to convince millions of his countrymen that the Weimar Republic was as bankrupt as Germany's economy. In 1933, Hitler maneuvered his way to become Chancellor of Germany then stalked out of the League of Nations and started to rearm. Britain, in turn, also began rearmament. The escalating arms race was alarmingly like Europe before 1914. But this arms race would provoke an extraordinary response from ordinary people back in Britain. Charles Borman was editor of the Ilford Recorder on the edge of London. I'm no millionaire, but I'm not the type to care. Because I've got a pocket full of dreams. Borman wanted the League to put pressure on Hitler. And so he launched what started as a little local campaign a questionnaire for the people of Ilford, which was taken door to door by volunteers from the League of Nations Union. Today, the League of Nations Union is largely forgotten, but in the 1930s, it was a hugely powerful pressure group. Inspired by the belief that peace would be the most sincere way to remember the dead of the Great War, it had an extraordinary reach into the British population. By 1931, the LNU had over 400,000 members in 3,000 branches across the country, with links to rotary groups, trade unions, Boy Scout troops, and women's institutes. In Ilford, 26,000 people responded to Charles Borman's appeal. Borman arranged a special meeting here in Ilford Town Hall in February 1934 to present the results to the press and the public. Robert Cecil was invited as guest of honour. Deeply impressed, he decided to try out the idea nationwide. And so the LNU launched what became popularly known as the Peace Ballot. Half a million LNU supporters volunteered to knock on doors and deliver and collect the forms. The questions weren't easy. For example, number four, about whether the manufacture of arms for private profit should be banned by international agreement. Some door knockers spent hours discussing the issues with people, often in their own homes. One man in Sussex answered yes to all six questions. His wife entered six no's. 
Completed questionnaires flooded in from cities, towns and villages. And the results were announced at a rally in London's Albert Hall in June 1935. The hall was packed and the atmosphere triumphant. Cecil would have been happy with five million responses, but the eventual total was 11.6 million more than a third of the British population over the age of 18. A truly extraordinary figure. The peace ballot showed a clear nationwide pattern. Over nine out of 10 respondents supported Britain's continued membership of the League of Nations and backed international agreements to reduce armaments. Even more remarkable, given our stereotype now of the appeasing 1930s, 60%, a clear majority, were willing to support military sanctions against aggressor states. Military sanctions meant running the risk of starting another war, a sobering gamble for a generation living in the shadow of 1914-18. But what's striking, even moving, is that nearly two-thirds of those who signed the peace ballot said they were willing to risk war in the hope of keeping the peace. The peace ballot was uniquely British, and in a way that would also have been inconceivable in Berlin or Moscow, it penetrated deep into London's corridors of power. The pressing problem for the British Foreign Office in 1935 was once again Mussolini. Fascist Italy had invaded the East African state of Abyssinia. And this provoked an outcry in Britain. Here was a crunch test for the League of Nations and its supporters. In public, the government took a firm pro-League line supporting limited economic sanctions against Italy. Otherwise, Foreign Secretary Sir Samuel Hoare told the Cabinet, there would be a wave of public opinion against the government. We're all out for peace. We're all out for carrying out our obligations under the League. But behind closed doors at the Foreign Office, the talk was very different. Samuel Hoare was a canny politician, irreverently known as Slippery Sam. In reality, he was pretty skeptical about the League and thought Cecil and the LNU were utopian. The war now looming, unlike 1914-18, would be truly global, with Japan an ally of Germany and Italy. So Hoare reverted to old-style power politics, Bypassing the League, he and his French counterpart Pierre Laval tried to buy off Mussolini. When the British and French deal-making was exposed, public uproar forced Hoare to resign. The new man at the Foreign Office came from the war generation and had made his political reputation as a champion of the League. Anthony Eden was dashing and handsome and had won the Military Cross in 1918. He also had a bizarre shared memory of the war with the most notorious veteran on the German side. Eden held talks with Hitler in Berlin in 1936. Chatting later at dinner, they discovered they'd been only 500 yards apart in the trenches in March 1918. Setting politics and nationalism aside, they nattered like old veterans, exchanging war stories and drawing maps of the front on the back of menu cards. After the dinner, the French ambassador took Eden aside. I understand you were opposite Hitler, and you missed? Eden always opposed doing deals with Mussolini and continued to take a pro-lead line. But now the public mood was shifting towards appeasement of Italy and Germany. 
because after 1936, people could begin to discern the face of a future war. The civil war in Spain showed the frightening power of aerial bombing, endured not in the trenches by soldiers like the last war, but in towns and cities by women and children. Tough sanctions against an aggressor might provoke apocalypse now. The 1930s came to their notorious climax in a desperate one-man crusade to prevent a second great war. By the time Neville Chamberlain took over as Prime Minister in 1937, the hopes for peace were narrowing. Chamberlain was another old man with a burden of guilt about the Great War hanging upon his shoulders. Like Robert Cecil, he'd been too old to fight and was gutted by the death in action of his younger cousin and closest friend, Norman. Now, like millions of British people, he was horrified by the terrible war that was looming. And like Sam Hall, he was ready to cut a deal to try to stop it. In September 1938, Chamberlain took to the air to avert the threat from the air, making a face-to-face -face deal with Hitler at Munich. Chamberlain's gamble delayed a new great war, but only for a year. We have done all that any country could do to establish peace. The situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted and no people or country could feel itself safe and become intolerable. The declaration of war in 1939 dashed the hopes of the 11.6 million people who'd signed the peace ballot. Back here in Ilford, the man who'd pioneered the ballot, Charles Borman, resigned as editor of the Ilford Recorder on the day that war broke out and signed up. That Essex man was going to war again seemed like an utterly damning comment on the meaning of every way totally different from the last. This time, Britain was heavily bombed and in danger of invasion. And the conflict was truly global, with Commonwealth forces engaged from North Africa to Singapore. This was also a war with heroes, like the fighter pilots who won the Battle of Britain, or the Australians who defended Tobruk, and heroic leaders. Looking back, 1914-18 seemed, by contrast, messy and inconclusive. This story of 1939-45 was celebrated in dozens of post-war British movies, pitting square-jawed goodies played by stars such as Jack Hawkins and Richard Todd against the evil Nazis. And evil was no mere cliché. The Nazis had hit depths of depravity previously unimagined in civilised Europe. A few miles from the great shrine of German culture, Weimar, was Buchenwald. 
Inside its grounds, this stump is all that's left of a fabled oak tree under which the poet Goethe wrote some of the classics of German literature. How far had Germany fallen? The camps showed to the world the utter barbarity of Nazi rule. This second war, unlike 1914-18, seemed unquestionably a good war. Truly a noble sacrifice to defeat an appalling evil. So 1914-18 shrank in significance. And this was reflected in a change of name. It may seem like a word game, but renaming the Great War as the First World War changed its meaning, officially highlighting the sense that 1914-18 had been a failed attempt to end war, an ineffectual sacrifice that required a second round. In fact, Winston Churchill and others now talked about a 30 years war from 1914 to 1945, into which the Great War was subsumed. Armistice Day, so sacred in the 30s, was now abandoned in favor of Remembrance Sunday for the dead of both world wars. You might have expected that with time, the First World War would slide into ever fainter memory. But in the 1960s, dramatic world events and a new generation once again combined to reinvent the war in public memory. The Great War had shaped the 1920s and 30s, but the 1960s shaped our view of the Great War. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. The Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, when the world seemed on the brink of a third world war, brought home to people the horrors of the nuclear age. The First World War, caused in 1914 by similar miscalculations by leaders, had cost 10 million dead. Another war, it seemed in the 60s, would be the war to end war, and probably the world as well. 1964 was 50 years since the outbreak of the Great War. It was a chance for a new generation to discover 1914-18 afresh. But they came at it through the tinted lens of World War II and amid nightmare fantasies about World War III. This was a less deferential generation, ready to question, even mock, the attitudes of their predecessors. And also a more egalitarian society, interested in the experience of ordinary soldiers rather than the posturings of upper-class generals. One of the most profound shifts in thinking about the war in the 1960s occurred in Germany. After 1945, most Germans still believed that the Hitler era was just a terrible blip in the proud sweep of Prussian and German history. They continued to look back on 1914-18 as a good war, fought in self-defense. But in 1961, an obscure leftist professor, Fritz Fischer, gained access to imperial German archives that were now in communist East Germany. Fischer published a book arguing that in 1914, Germany had caused the war by launching an all-out grab for world power. 
Germany was not the victim, it was the aggressor, just as in 1939. I tried to show that 1914, Germany kept the aims she was pursuing since the last century. A position of Germany in Europe and the world on equal footing with the British Empire. What's important to understand about Fischer is that he was attacking head on the comfortable West German story that the crimes of the Nazi era were the work of just a few evil men. Instead, he argued that Hitler was the culmination of an aggressive militarism ingrained in German history right back to the days of Bismarck and Frederick the Great. Fischer's dramatic claims captured the imagination of a rebellious younger generation and sparked years of furious debate among politicians and the media. The irony is that just when Germans were being forced to think about 1914 as an immoral war caused by their own country's aggression, most British people came to see it as a war that had no clear cause, no moral justification, and achieved nothing at all. In Britain, it would be a piece of theatre about the war that set the tone for this new era much as Journey's End had done 30 years earlier. Oh, What a Lovely War started life here in East London as a production of Joan Littlewood's theatre workshop, before going on to have global impact as a feature film. Like the first night of Journey's End, the audience in the theatre was overwhelmed. Many were in tears. Oh, What a Lovely War was the story of ordinary men squandered in hopeless offensives by aristocratic, boneheaded generals convinced that victory was just around the corner. It was savaging the apparent futility of the Great War, but also satirising the class war within it. At the moment, my men are advancing across no man's land in full pack. The men are forbidden on pain of court-martial to take cover in any shell hole or dugout. The loss of, say, another 300,000 men may lead to really great results. Oh, what a lovely war drew on a mishmash of often partial sources, quoted out of context to skewer the generals. The soldiers were now not real people, as in Journey's End. They were simply victims. This idea of the Great War as futile slaughter was reinforced by a uniquely British obsession one that seared the memory of the war into the imagination of an even younger generation. In the 1960s, Britain rediscovered the poetry of the Great War as publishers produced several new 50th anniversary anthologies. The soldier poets of the Great War have become our most trusted guides to the meaning of the conflict. These anthologies shaped how the war has been taught in schools and understood in public memory. But in reality, they are carefully edited selections that preach a particular message about the war. Great poetry, bad history. Because the anthologies took a few soldier poets as the authentic voices of the war and portrayed them moving along a kind of poetic learning curve, from the innocent patriotism of Rupert Brooke to the bleak pity of Wilfred Owen, as the horrors of war are revealed at the Somme and Passchendaele. Owen was killed in the last week of the war while peace terms were being discussed, so his death seems to sum up neatly the futility of the conflict.
but the real story is more intriguing. Here in 1918, in the beautiful Physic Garden in Chelsea, Owen wrestled with whether to return to frontline duty. For several hours on a hot summer afternoon, his friend Siegfried Sassoon tried to dissuade him, but Owen did go back. Today, Wilfred Owen is regarded as the archetypal war poet, meaning a soldier poet who was anti-war. But Owen's poetry, like his decision to go back to fight on the Western Front, reveals something more complex. Owen's poems convey the ecstasy of fighting, as well as the horrors of dying. Owen was not a pacifist. In fact, he won the military cross for mowing down Germans with a machine gun. But his younger brother, Harold, self-appointed custodian of Wilfred's memory, tried to conceal this in the 1960s because being a killer did not fit the image of a poet renowned for evoking the pity of war. Wilfred Owen's poem, Exposure, is now usually quoted to illustrate the misery of soldiers here on the front line. But in it, Owen also conjures up a peaceful England worth fighting for and dying for. Since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn, nor ever sun smile true on child or field or fruit. Therefore, not loath, we lie out here. Exposure suggests that even in the last months of the war, Owen still believed the struggle had meaning. But the Owen of 1918 was repackaged for the anti-war 1960s, helping set firm public memory of a war suffered by poetic soldiers and waged by stupid generals. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. The solemn call to remember carries a huge burden of sadness and duty. But unlike the immovable pillars and headstones of the Western Front, public memory, as we've seen, has been moulded, even caricatured, by what happened after the Great War. We have remembered the soldiers and tried to imagine the warfare they endured. But that's got in the way of understanding the Great War's full character and impact. Of course, we can't ignore the mud and the suffering, but I believe that 100 years on from 1914, it's time to let go of the dead. We can't just feel the Great War as a piece of poetry or a stark morality play. We need to understand it as history, history that cast long shadows over the years that followed. A hundred years on, the Great War still has enduring resonance. But our understanding of it is often a caricatured mixture of mud and death, poets and poppies. In this series, I want to clamber out of the trenches to explore the deeper meaning of the Great War and its momentous legacies. One paradox of the war is that it wasn't caused by profound political or ideological divisions, but it did create them in its wake. The war made politics red hot. It gave birth to an age of mass democracy with the vote extended to ordinary men and women. Today, we take democracy for granted. Elections are familiar, even boring. But a century ago, democracy hit Europe like a big bang. 
In the aftermath of war, the old order was blown apart and the people rose up. Three leaders offered three very different visions for harnessing and directing this people power. Three ideologies that would convulse the world. First, Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized control in Russia. They presented their one-party state as the stepping stone to a workers' paradise. A series of copycat revolutions ignited the center of Europe. Second, Woodrow Wilson, the American president, championed liberty and republicanism with no place for monarchs and aristocrats. By 1919, Europe had nine new American-style republics. A third leader, Benito Mussolini in Italy, smashed communism and rejected liberal democracy to pioneer a new militaristic ideology with a cult of the great leader. His model, fascism, would inspire demagogues right across the continent. Communism and fascism were dramatic, dynamic and seductive. The big ideas in the aftermath of the Great War, and they polarized much of Europe between left and right. But one country peculiarly muddled on, little touched by these great ideological battles. Britain. Its unlikely leaders were pipe-smoking parliamentarians, forging a series of coalitions and reaching for the centre ground. And while monarchs toppled across Europe, the British royal family was rebranded as a symbol of the nation and apex of the British dominions in the Commonwealth. In fundamental ways, I think, the long shadow of the Great War has shaped the politics of Britain and the world right up to the present day. A century on from 1914, we are still trying to manage the explosive force of democracy. The Great War was a people's war, truly democratic in its impact. It was indiscriminate in its slaughter of officers and conscripts. It also demanded the toil and the sweat of millions of men and women on the home front. Unable to win a quick victory, the warring powers were forced to mobilize their whole economies and societies. This total war imposed a massive strain. The question was, which country would buckle first? Nineteen seventeen was the year when the old world order started to crack. In the Russian capital, Petrograd, the bread supply collapsed, triggering a wave of strikes and street protests that toppled the Tsar. Soviets, or workers' councils, spread virus light through factories and the army. By the end of 1917, Lenin and the Bolsheviks had seized power in the name of the workers. Their ideology of class revolution directed by a one-party state posed a radical challenge to the old world order of empires, monarchies and parliaments. Democracy can mean very different things. For us, it's a political idea, freedom of speech and free elections. But for revolutionary Marxists like Lenin, it was more about economics and equality, seizing private property in the name of the workers and forging a modern industrial state. When Germany and Austria-Hungary collapsed in the autumn of 1918, revolution spread from Russia across the continent. 
one uprising in the name of democracy triggering others. You can think of it as a European precursor to the Arab Spring of our own day. A botched but bloody revolt engulfed Berlin and communist governments were proclaimed in Hungary and Bavaria. In Britain, the masses also seem to be getting Bolshe. Soldiers mutinied at their camp in Calais. And miners, railwaymen and transport workers launched one of the biggest waves of strikes in British history, threatening to bring the country to a standstill. In the corridors of power, there was genuine fear of Bolshevik-style revolution. After pushing his way through a lobby of soldiers in Whitehall, Sir Henry Wilson, chief of the Imperial General Staff, told the cabinet grimly that the men bore a dangerous resemblance to a Soviet. Mainstream politics in Britain were also taking a leap into the unknown by opening up the ballot box. In the shadow of the terrible carnage, the government had granted the masses a say in running the country. In 1918, the vote was given to almost all men over the age of 21 and most women over 30. Then on the 14th of December, little more than a month after the armistice to end the war, Britain went to the polls in its first truly general election. The electorate had almost tripled in size, but how would these unpredictable new voters, male and female, use their new power? Adding to the tension, the election results would not be declared for a full two weeks until after Christmas, so that millions of soldiers' votes could come in from abroad. Amid this fevered atmosphere, another vision of radical politics took Britain by storm. This came not from alien Russia, but from a leader that the British like to think of as their friend. Come from every quarter, from the north, south, east, and west, to clear the way to freedom for the land we love the best. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 with your haircut just a short as mine. On Boxing Day 1918, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, rode into town. Thousands thronged the streets, cheering his carriage. Wilson was an unlikely celebrity. Austere and intellectual, a devout Presbyterian, sure of his own rightness. But he was also a bit of a showman who knew how to play to the gallery. And in London, he dramatically highlighted his distance from the British government. Wilson intended to signal that America had fought for much purer war aims than his allies, the empires of old Europe, to make the world safe for democracy in the egalitarian, republican, American mode. While in London, Wilson was guest of honour at a victory dinner, hosted by the British King George V here at Buckingham Palace. Hundreds of generals and politicians, princes and ambassadors from across the British Empire were arrayed in all their finery. Wilson cut a very different figure, dressed in an ordinary black suit without medal or braid, and his clipped Cold speech made no reference to the contribution of the British Empire in the Allied victory. The gilded audience at Buckingham Palace was chilled, almost as if they had seen the ghost of Oliver Cromwell. A few days later, the election results were finally declared. Having been spooked by the slogans of Lenin and Wilson, 
the British elite were relieved when the ballot boxes were finally opened. Britain's wartime coalition government was re-elected with a huge majority. Giving the vote to ordinary men and women hadn't triggered revolution after all. Britain had scraped through its immediate post-war crisis. The big bang of democracy had been contained. But not every country was so fortunate. In other parts of Europe in 1918, the political turmoil sparked by communism and mass voting produced a radical reaction, a militaristic nationalism centered on the cult of the strong leader, fascism. The testing ground for this new type of ideology was Italy. And the story starts with a desperate battle across this mountain river. Italy had a poisonous Great War. In 1915, it entered the conflict on the side of the Allies, but without broad public support. Divisions were then made worse by the Italian High Command's bungling campaign against Austria-Hungary. Maintaining discipline through savage punishments and random executions of his men, during 1916 and 1917, the Army Chief of Staff, Luigi Cadorna, drove his troops forward mercilessly, one offensive after another up the steep Alpine mountains rising from the Isonzo River. The futility of these assaults makes the first day of the Somme look like a work of military genius. Eventually, in October 1917, at the 12th Battle of the Isonzo, things completely fell apart for the Italians. Today, the battle is better known as Caporetto, the great humiliation of Italy's war. Bolstered by German stormtroopers, the Austro-Hungarian army launched several surprise counter-offensives. One of them was led by a daring young German commander called Erwin Rommel. In just over two days, Rommel's single platoon advanced over 10 miles, capturing two whole Italian regiments. Rommel had soon realized that Italian morale was brittle. Pressing on resolutely with just a pistol in his hand, he overawed the Italians with his personal courage. They rushed forward, throwing down their rifles and shouting, Eviva Germania, before hoisting an astonished Rommel onto their shoulders. The Italians reeled back to within 30 kilometers of Venice. 300,000 were taken prisoner. Another 350,000 deserted. Caporetto entered the Italian language as a word for shambolic collapse. Italy emerged from the war divided and frustrated. To placate the returning troops, in 1918, the government in Rome gave all adult men the vote. Crucially, the voting system was proportional representation, something discussed but rejected in Britain. PR, by encouraging small parties, led to highly fragmented coalitions in Parliament, making Italy ungovernable. Strikes by workers and farmers provoked a sharp backlash from right-wing paramilitary groups. Foremost among these were the black shirts, who called themselves fascists, harking back to the symbol of authority in ancient Rome, the fasces. In 
Their leader was Benito Mussolini, a journalist and Great War veteran, who'd served on the front at the Isonzo River until accidentally injured by a mortar bomb. Mussolini was originally a socialist, but as a soldier, he became a passionate pro-war nationalist, fuming about incompetent leaders and striking workers. For a time, he was even in the pay of British intelligence as a useful anti-Bolshevik, getting the not insignificant sum of 100 pounds a week. But Mussolini did not intend to work for anyone except himself. Mussolini cleverly rebranded his fascist movement as a political party. That allowed him to play the parliamentary game while keeping the thugs up his sleeve. When in 1922, socialists mounted a general strike, Mussolini's fascist bother boys marched on Rome. The government caved in under this pressure and the king appointed Mussolini Prime Minister. Mussolini then forced through a new election law, giving two-thirds of the seats in Parliament to the party that won a quarter of the votes, a figure the fascist squads could ensure through intimidation. And so, in Italy, the democratic experiment proved short-lived. Like Lenin, Mussolini believed that liberal democracy was a relic of the past. Parliamentary politics produced only corruption and paralysis. Yet in post-war Britain, parliamentary government survived. What's more, a socialist party became part of the political mainstream and a king remained the head of state. Unlike other countries that fought the Great War, Britain managed to hold these incongruous elements together. That, I think, was largely due to two politicians who tend to be written off today. First, Stanley Baldwin, a Worcestershire industrialist, conservative leader for 14 years from 1923 to 1937, and prime minister three times. The country needs well-tried and experienced men at the helm. It is no time for weak government. The nation cannot afford to embark on reckless experiments. Behind the bluff exterior, this was a shrewd politician with a distinctive take on how to cope with the post-war era of mass politics. Baldwin was concerned about how, as he put it, democracy had arrived at a gallop. Giving the vote to the masses was potentially very risky. If democracy was not kept on a tight rein, Britain would be riding for a fall. Woodrow Wilson had talked about making the world safe for democracy. Baldwin's take was very different. We must make democracy safe for the world. Baldwin's plan for making democracy safe was to stake out the centre ground of politics, quietly redistributing wealth, even if that meant hurting the landed rich, the Tories' natural constituency. In 1919, inheritance tax rates soared to 40% and then up to 50% after 1930, forcing the sell-off, break-up and even demolition of many grand estates. This is Woolerton Hall, once the baronial seat of the Willoughby family. The Willoughbys served king and country in the Great War, in 1915, Francis Willoughby was killed in Flanders, and in 1916, Henry Willoughby died at the naval battle of Jutland, while the remaining brother, Michael, was awarded the military cross for service in Mesopotamia. But then, after the war, 
the Willoughbys were stuffed by the government's inheritance tax. By the time Michael Willoughby inherited this house in 1924 as the 11th Baron Middleton, he was forced to sell up. Nottingham Corporation bought the park for the public and used some 300 acres of land to build homes for the people. Today, the old house is home to Nottingham's natural history collection. The author Charles Masterman called the breakup of old estates like Woolerton perhaps the greatest change in the history of the land in England since the Norman Conquest. Just as remarkable as the Tories' adaptation to the era of democracy was the shift of the Labour Party from the radical fringe before the Great War to the centre of British politics after it. This was a story of New Labour, 20s style. Giving workers the vote as a reward for their war efforts began to tilt the balance of British politics. In January 1924, Labour, led by James Ramsay MacDonald, was able to form a minority government, the party's very first taste of power. MacDonald and his cabinet were summoned to the palace. Deputy Leader of the House, John Clines, recalled later, As we were waiting for His Majesty, amid the gold and crimson magnificence of the palace, I could not help marvel the strange turn of fortune's wheel which had brought MacDonald, the starveling clerk, and Clines, the mill hand, to this pinnacle. We were making history. But George V reflected in his diary that Queen Victoria would not have been amused. It is 23 years to the day since dear Grandmama died. I wonder what she would have made of a Labour government. Before meeting his new cabinet here in Buckingham Palace, the King recalled reports of a recent rally at the Albert Hall, where Labour supporters had sung the Marseillaise. His cousin Tsar Nicholas had been gunned down by the Bolsheviks and one Labour MP warned darkly of what happened to Charles I when he opposed a people's government. But the King's fears would prove groundless. Like Baldwin, Ramsay MacDonald was a pragmatist drawn to the centre ground. As Prime Minister in 1924 and again in 1929 to 31, Macdonald's priority was to make socialism respectable. In 1931, Macdonald turned to Wall Street for financial support to stop a massive run on the pound. The conditions the American bankers attached were harsh, including a cut in unemployment benefit, and they split the Labour cabinet. An exhausted MacDonald went to the palace and offered to resign. But the King's opinion of MacDonald had come a long way since 1924. George V insisted that he was the only man to lead the country through the crisis, playing on MacDonald's vanity and also his patriotism, a sensitive issue after the nightmare of the war. The royal arm twisting worked. In an extraordinary compromise to weather the financial crisis, MacDonald formed an emergency coalition with the Liberals and Baldwin's Conservatives. The national government, instigated by George V as a short-term crisis measure, went on to run Britain for the rest of the 1930s. While most of the crowned heads of Europe were long gone, the House of Windsor was becoming a keystone of political stability in Britain's new democracy. 
something few would have predicted amid the revolutionary fervor of Europe in 1918. In private, George V was not a very attractive person. A martinet to his children and obsessive about court protocol. He was happiest when sticking stamps into his stamp album or shooting defenseless animals. But in his own way, the king was a patriot with a paternalistic feel for his people. The king learned to speak to the nation and the wider Commonwealth via the new medium of radio, though this was quite an ordeal. His first Christmas broadcast in 1932 was delivered with a thick cloth on the table to muffle the sound of pages rustling in his trembling hand. I can only say to you, my very dear people, that the Queen and I thank you from the depths of our hearts I dedicate myself anew to your service for the years that may still be given to me. So the British monarchy, German in origin, aristocratic to the core and deeply dysfunctional in private, was remarketed for the modern age as the royal family. Harold Lasky, the Labour intellectual, observed with grudging admiration, the monarchy has been sold to the democracy as the symbol of itself. To see how unusual Britain's democracy was, you only need to look at continental Europe. While Britain muddled on with a coalition government under a constitutional monarchy, in Italy, Mussolini was now in his prime as Il Duce, the great militarist leader, overriding people and parliament. In the 1930s at Red Puglia, near the disastrous battlefield of Caporetto, Mussolini built an extraordinary monument containing 100,000 Italian dead of the Great War. It's all very different from London's understated cenotaph. Here is an army of the dead, arrayed rock-like, line after line, when the reality of Caporetto was chaotic rout. It's not so much a war memorial, more a fascist fantasy. Through fascism, Italy's shambolic war could be turned into grand opera and the will of the masses harnessed to a monolithic national party. This was Mussolini's distinctive vision of democracy. Discipline must be accepted. When it is not accepted, it must be imposed. Fascism rejects in democracy the conventional lie of political equality. The present century is a century of authority, a century of the right, a fascist century. Fascists like Mussolini were convinced that the masses needed firm leadership from a Superman figure. Although we now think of Mussolini as a kind of theatrical joke, he did inspire others to take an iron grip on the ballot box. Today, Superman is a cartoon character. But in the early 20th century, this idea of a dynamic force, taken from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, gripped people's imaginations at a time when parliamentary politics seemed corrupt and ineffective. Mm -hmm. 
The most familiar example is Adolf Hitler. But this yearning for a Superman caught on right across Europe, even in advanced civilized countries like France. Although France, like Britain, emerged victorious in 1918, it soon slipped into the political whirlpool that typified continental Europe. As in Italy and in Britain, the nature of the constitution really mattered. The Third Republic's constitution had been designed to block the rise of a Napoleon-style superman. But this led to a weak government and a strong parliament. The result was political division, a wide variety of parties who formed unstable, short-lived coalitions here in the National Assembly. France had over 40 separate governments between 1918 and 1940, a striking contrast with Britain. And in the 1930s, as the divide between right and left deepened, France seemed close to civil war. The country's socialist and communist left, the biggest in Europe, did not accommodate itself to the establishment like the British Labour Party. And the left was challenged from the right by fascist-style paramilitaries, many of them war veterans who terrorised red districts. In February 1934, fascist leagues massed here in the Place de la Concorde site of the guillotine during the French Revolution and at the very heart of Paris. Police stopped the protesters getting across the River Seine to the National Assembly, but during a night of rioting, 16 people were killed. Next day, the leftist government resigned. This was an ominous sign of street power. French democracy came under even greater strain in 1936, when a new left-wing government was elected. Investors fled the country, forcing a devaluation of the franc. In Paris's eighth arrondissement, a fascist leader in the making brooded unhappily in the wings. Philippe Pétain, hero of the defense of Verdun in 1916, was invited to address the nation on the radio to mark the 20th anniversary of the battle, France's most costly victory of the Great War. Mesdames, Messieurs, c'est au génie français que nous voulons rendre hommage aujourd'hui. Pétain wanted to say, France, having won the war, is on the verge of losing the peace. To his fury, that was censored by the government. But Pétain was still able to make clear his conviction that French politics and society had become rotten. There is a whole program that must be revived. Family, school, army, the three guiding steps which make a child into a man. In 1936, Pétain's time had not yet come. But fractured from within, France was in no position to stand up to the looming threat from the supermen of Italy and Germany. On the continent, extremist politics were driven by charismatic leaders and personality cults. Britain, too, had its fascists. But Oswald Mosley, unlike Mussolini and Hitler, could never turn his fringe operation into a mass political party. By dominating the political centre, the national government squeezed out extremist demagogues like Mosley, and it also pushed Britain's most charismatic conviction politicians out of mainstream politics. The superman whom Stanley Baldwin really feared 
was Winston Churchill. This was a politician whose formidable will and boundless energy seemed potentially destructive. At times, Churchill's loathing of Bolshevism made him sound positively anti-democratic. Visiting Rome in 1927, Churchill lavished praise on Mussolini. If I had been an Italian, I am sure I would have been wholeheartedly with you from start to finish in your triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. In the 1930s, desperate to get back into office, Churchill attacked the national government again and again. On some issues, he was proved right, notably rearmament against Nazi Germany. On others, he seems to us now an impossible reactionary, particularly over India. Baldwin wanted to give India greater self-government. Part of his attempt to move the British Empire on into the age of democracy. Churchill was a passionate, die-hard opponent. During a break in one of the bitter Commons debates on India, Churchill popped into the jets. Only one space was vacant and he found himself standing next to Baldwin. There was an embarrassed silence. Even more embarrassed than is usual on such gentlemanly occasions. Then Baldwin said, Well, I'm glad there's still one platform where we can meet together. But Britain's stability in the 1930s, compared with the chaos on the continent, wasn't just a matter of politics. There were deeper economic forces at work. Now, we tend to stereotype the 1930s as a uniformly bleak era of depression and mass unemployment. But after 1933, there was a surge in new industries producing cars and consumer goods. The good times were felt in the Midlands and particularly the Southeast. And the national government's policy of low interest rates fueled a house building boom. In contrast to Germany and France's packed, rented tenement blocks where poverty and protest could fester, in Britain, suburban semis spread through the southern half of the country. Democracy in Britain had been established by political compromise and then buttressed by economic recovery. But Britain's peculiar dynamics of democracy threw up victims as well as winners. The trade-off for the nation's heartland doing well was poverty on the periphery. Coal, textiles and shipbuilding were in decline. The Great War had stimulated new and cheaper production across the world, right out to India and China. In the old industrial areas of Northern England, Scotland and South Wales, the 20s and 30s were an era of almost unrelieved depression. Here, veterans of the Great War and their sons spent years on the dole. The victims took to the streets. So-called national hunger marches on London became a feature of the period. The industrial North and West were Labour's heartland. Their sense of betrayal would fuel the party's politics when it finally got back into power. But that was only after a second brutal war in which two ideologies spawned by the Great War, fascism and communism, 
fought their climactic battle. By 1945, Hitler and Mussolini were dead. Fascism and Nazism, things of the past. Now only the heirs of Lenin and Wilson remained. Locking horns in a half century of Cold War, both talked the language of democracy, but in very different tones. The Soviets championed a one-party state and a command economy to promote equality. The Americans offered political freedoms and unregulated capitalism in the name of liberty. Meanwhile, the British, yet again, contrived their own peculiar compromise version of democracy. But this time, in reaction to the political settlement of the 20s and 30s. The new pattern was defined by the Labour government of 1945, led by Clement Attlee, himself a great war veteran, wounded at Gallipoli in 1915. Labour's case was clearly set out here in its 1945 election manifesto. This argued that after 1918, the people had allowed the hard-faced men who'd done well out of the war to craft the kind of peace that suited themselves. Labour intended to use its massive commons majority to right what it saw as the wrongs of the 20s and 30s. State ownership of the coal mines was the last battle in a long war that stretched back into the Victorian era and the mass strikes after the Great War. And similarly, there was real elation when in July 1948, the Minister of Health, Aniron Bevan, was ceremonially handed the keys of Park Hospital Davy Hume near Manchester, the first NHS hospital in the country. Bevan watched as a 13-year-old girl became the first patient to benefit from free and comprehensive medical care. Labour proudly claimed that 2,751 hospitals had been brought under state ownership on the same day. It appeared that Britain was making a radical departure from the past. But behind all the symbolism, Attlee's revolution was a very British form of socialism, mixing public and private. The National Health Service, for instance, nationalised the patients, but allowed doctors to continue their private practice. Only in the 1980s, under Margaret Thatcher, was Labour's social democracy programme seriously questioned. Under Thatcher, some of the state industries were dismantled and privatised, but the underlying balance of public versus private remains a live political issue to this day. Although Churchill is now widely regarded as the greatest Britain because of his war leadership, it's Attlee's peace settlement that still shapes contemporary Britain. And that was itself a reaction to the era of Macdonald and Baldwin, two leaders who helped make Britain a stable democracy at the price of deepening the North-South divide. As dozens of young men pulled on a rope and chains, the chant went up, Mauer weg, done with the wall. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, Communism joined fascism in the dustbin of history. But the other great ideologies spawned by the Great War, Woodrow Wilson's all-American vision of global democracy, was given a new lease of life by the George W. Bush administration. Oh, my God, oh my God. All right. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my God.
When Al-Qaeda attacked America on the 11th of September 2001, Bush's advisers wanted to use American power to enforce liberal democratic values, especially in the Middle East. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, and freedom will be defended. The American invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq were based on the simplistic assumption that toppling a tyrant would produce freedom and democracy. It was rather like the heady hopes across Europe in 1918. The ensuing mess was a painful reminder that Wilsonianism was no more an easy answer at the start of the 21st century than it had been in the aftermath of the Great War. In 2011, a wave of popular uprisings in support of democracy toppled more tyrants in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. The wind of change has come. Egypt, congratulations, congratulations to the whole Arab world. We've done it. The echoes of Europe in 1918 are clear. And now, just as then, real freedom and stability remain elusive. Almost a century on from the European spring of 1918, the challenge is still, as Stanley Baldwin recognised, to make democracy safe for the world. This is the upper Silesian coal field in Central Europe, a place haggled and fought over by rival nations for almost a century. During the Great War, this coal was in the Habsburg Empire, Austria-Hungary. As revolution swept away the old empires in 1918, it was taken over by Poland. A year later, it belonged to a new state called Czechoslovakia. In 1938, the Poles got the coal again. In 1939, it was seized by Nazi Germany. After 1945, it was Czechoslovakian once more, but under Soviet control. In 1993, it was in a new state called the Czech Republic. And then, in 2004, this coal joined the European Union. That story of one lump of coal sums up the history of Europe's brutal 20th century. The them versus us struggle between nations was a root cause of the Great War. And national rivalries, particularly over vital war-making resources like coal and iron, continued to cast a shadow over the decades that followed, setting government against government and blighting the lives of ordinary people. In this series, I'm exploring the meaning and legacy of the Great War. And nowhere was that legacy more profound than in the unleashing of nationalist fervour. The war made national identity a stark either-or issue, a matter of us versus them. And Europe's story in the century after the Great War has been a recurrent struggle between nationalist fragmentation and empire building. I want to compare what happened to two of the great European empires of 1914. The Habsburg Empire, Austria-Hungary, collapsed under the burden of war. Its territory was parceled out among five new nation states. But these new states, hastily patched together, would destabilize the whole European continent for much of the 20th century. The second great power is Britain, and its story was very different. The British Empire grew, ruling nearly a quarter of the Earth's land surface and population. Before 1914, Britain itself seemed to be breaking apart. But the Great War actually strengthened England's union with Scotland and Wales. 
A feel-good sense of Britishness endured for over half a century and only recently has been seriously challenged. The movement for national self-determination is alive and well. The grim exception in the British story is Ireland. There, imperial oppression, ethnic nationalism, and paramilitary violence were closer to the experience of Central Europe, leaving shadows that have darkened Irish and British history to the present day. In grappling with the forces of nationalism, the not-so-united kingdom is still in the long shadow of the Great War. Historians love to debate how wars start, but what really matters about the Great War is how it ended. The vast dynastic empires of continental Europe, built up over centuries, disintegrated in just a few weeks. The greatest of these was the Habsburg Empire, Austria-Hungary. The empire, centered on Vienna and 50 million strong, was Europe's third most populous state, yet it was a loosely sewn tapestry of national groups. For every 100 men in the Habsburg Imperial Army in 1914, there were on average 25 German speakers, 18 Hungarians, 13 Czechs, 11 Serbs and Croats, nine Poles, nine Ruthenes, six Romanians, four Slovaks, two Slovenes, and a couple of Italian speakers. Pity the poor officers who had to whip that lot into shape as an army. National self-consciousness among these ethnic groups of the Habsburg Empire was rising before the war. Mass literacy and print newspapers enable propagandists to play up an us versus them sense of identity. And when Habsburg power crumbled in 1918, nationalist leaders seized their moment to unweave the imperial tapestry and stitch together new nations. One of the most resourceful was the Czech intellectual, Tomas Masaryk who spent most of his war in exile in genteel Hampstead. Travelling into town on the bus, he taught at London University and cultivated his contacts in the British Foreign Office. On statues and photographs, Masaryk looks pretty grim. He was a serious academic who specialised in philosophy and sociology. One of his publications was entitled Suicide as a Social Mass Phenomenon of Modern Civilization." But the bookish philosopher proved a skilful politician. Just weeks after the armistice that ended the war, Masaryk returned in triumph to his home city of Prague as president of the new invented state of the Czechs and Slovaks, Czechoslovakia. Masaryk's coup was copied across much of the former Habsburg Empire, with more or less bloodshed, as nationalist politicians grabbed power. But their new nations caused nightmares for the politicians gathering in Paris to hammer out the peace treaty that would officially end the Great War. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run. 
Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. We tend to think of the Paris peacemakers as the grand designers of the new map of Europe, blaming them for the border conflicts and ethnic tensions that afflicted the continent after 1918. But in reality, by the time the peace conference opened in Paris, the outlines of post-imperial Europe were clear on the ground. Independence had been proclaimed for Czechoslovakia, for Poland, and for a kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, soon to be called Yugoslavia. This left once great Hungary and Austria as disgruntled little states. Most Austrians wanted to be part of Germany. Woodrow Wilson, Lloyd George, and the other statesmen in Paris could do little more than tidy up the new European map, and they did so in a rush without much knowledge or information. On one occasion, President Wilson's wife came across her husband and other leaders on their hands and knees on the floor, poring over a map of Europe, trying to determine the borders of some obscure new state. She found it rather amusing. You look like a lot of little boys playing a game. Wilson looked up wearily. Alas, it is the most serious game ever undertaken, for on the result of it hangs, in my estimation, the future peace of the world. War had let the genie of nationalism out of the bottle, and the peacemakers could not put it back. The worst flashpoints were the disputed new borderlands. This is the town of Tischen. In 1914, it was the Duchy of Teschen, a tiny province of the Habsburg Empire. Under the Habsburgs, Poles and Czechs lived here together, a mix of Catholics and Protestants getting on OK without too much friction but things had changed dramatically by 1918. Teschen spanned the border between the new states of Poland and Czechoslovakia. It included a river crossing, a coal field, and a strategic railway junction. So the town became a real bone of contention. The Paris peacemakers spent hours on the matter besieged by Czech and Polish delegates, banging on about the new slogan of national self-determination and armed to the teeth with maps, graphs and statistics. The British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, had never heard of Teschen beforehand. By the end of the peace conference, it was a name he would never forget. Eventually, the Allies set up a commission which partitioned the whole area. The Czech state got most of the coal field, even though half the miners were Poles, while the town of Teschen was split in two. One bemused American observer recalled, The larger eastern portion goes to the Poles, but the western part, with the railroad station, goes to the Czechs. The electric light plant goes to the one state, but the gas works to the other, and I do not recall what was to become of the municipal waterworks. So the new post-war nations were formed with disputed boundaries and fractious minorities. Masaryk's Czechoslovakia was in its own way a troubled mini-empire. The Czechs dominated the government, keeping under their thumb disaffected ethnic groups such as the Ukrainians, the Hungarians, the Poles and the Jews. But the minority that eventually would really matter was the Germans. 
In border towns like Kadan, the German population felt alienated from the new Czechoslovak state. They wanted to be part of the German-speaking heart of the old Habsburg Empire, Austria. In March 1919, when demonstrators raised the German flag over the central square and sang German nationalist songs, Czech soldiers panicked. 24 Germans were killed and some 80 wounded. The Kadan massacre, memorialized here in the town cemetery, was an early sign of the ethnic conflicts that would ravage Europe for years to come. The frenzy of nationalism after the Great War caused chaos and suffering, but it also raised a more fundamental question. Was nation building a zero-sum game? In other words, can I feel secure only if you do not feel secure? Or can we together create some larger grouping in which we both feel equally at home? Much of Europe's history in the 20th century would revolve around those questions. The story of nationalism in Britain and its empire was very different from that of Central Europe. The stereotype we have now of British dominions like Canada, Australia and New Zealand is that the war drove them further down the path of independence from the mother country. In 1915 at Gallipoli, the Anzac myth was born, of rugged fighters from the bush and of a classless society defined above all by a deep loyalty to one's mates, rather than to the poms, especially snooty English officers. And at battles like Fromel in 1916 and Vimy Ridge in 1917, Dominion forces fought heroically. The war kindled a new sense of national pride, but also, for many whose families had migrated from Britain, a strong sense of being part of a British world, as newer and better Britons. Much of the British Isles, too, was brought closer together through war. The United Kingdom had appeared to be pulling apart. In 1912, the Liberal government introduced a Home Rule Bill for Ireland, where nationalist feeling, rooted in the Gaelic language and the Catholic faith, had been on the boil for decades. In response, Protestants in Ulster organised paramilitary units, the Ulster Volunteers, or UVF. The stage seemed set for civil war. Ireland hit the headlines, but it wasn't the only nationalist problem. In 1913, Scottish radicals introduced their own Home Rule Bill. And in Wales, nationalists, backed by the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, David Lloyd George, campaigned for the disestablishment of the Anglican Church in Wales, whose large estates reinforced the power of English landlords. So in the summer of 1914, the United Kingdom looked increasingly disunited. But then, everything changed. In the July crisis, after the assassination of the heir to the Habsburg throne, the European powers mobilised for war. What counted for Lloyd George and much of the public was the rights of small nations like Serbia and especially neutral Belgium as the German army brutally invaded the country. British opinion was shocked by lurid reports about the shooting of hundreds of Belgian civilians. And there was outrage at the German shelling of the great cathedral at Reims in France. British values of freedom and civilization 
seem to be pitted against a menacing alien force, the Hun. The British government played up the issue for propaganda to a cheering London audience. Lloyd George praised the resistance of Belgium and Serbia. Like Wales, he said, little five foot five nations fighting for freedom against the great big Prussian Junker, storming around like the road hog of Europe. And so the national question within the United Kingdom, which had dominated the run up to war, was suddenly eclipsed by fury about German imperialism. Johnny good luck to Johnny Canuck and all the allied soldiers they're fighting day by day. With this dramatic turnaround, even Catholic Irishmen were ready to join the British Army to enlist in a Europe-wide fight for freedom. Irish home rule and Welsh disestablishment were approved by Parliament, but put on ice for the duration of the war. Scotland's home rule bill was dropped because of pressure of wartime business. The war economy fueled a coal, steel and shipbuilding boom in Wales and Scotland. Then the fighting itself changed the national debate. Soldiers from Scots and Welsh regiments gave their lives for the British cause in the great battles along the Western Front. So the experience of war drew Scotland and also Wales back into the Union. Nationalist politics faded away. After the Great War, most people felt Scots or Welsh, but also British, and proud of it. Across the Irish Sea, however, the story was very different. To Blood sacrifices in 1916 helped split Ireland asunder. Here in Ireland, uniquely in Europe, nationalists made a bid for independence during the Great War. In April 1916, Sinn Féin, a fringe nationalist republican movement, launched a coup, hoping to seize Dublin with weapons supplied by Germany. Here at the General Post Office, they melodramatically proclaimed an Irish Republic. But the coup was botched. Only a few hundred men were involved, and the rebels had little support from the bulk of the population. Some local women, married to soldiers fighting for the British Army in France, were furious that the siege prevented them from getting into the post office to draw their military allowances. British troops brought up heavy artillery and blasted the rebels into surrender. By the weekend, the British had regained control of the post office and the city. The Easter Rising might have faded away as a crazy act of folly, but for the brutal reaction of British military commanders. Martial law was imposed, some 3,000 people were arrested, and the ringleaders executed. The executions transformed what had seemed a loony left into national martyrs, hallowed in mourning badges and iconic photographs. Then came the second, very different, blood sacrifice of 1916. At Tiefval Ridge on the 1st of July, the opening day of the Battle of the Somme, the 36th Ulster Division went over the top. 
The 36 were largely Protestants from Belfast, many of them previously in the paramilitary Ulster Volunteers. And the 1st of July marked the traditional anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, when William of Orange repulsed the Catholics. The Ulster boys fought their way through the first line of German trenches and on to the second, before they were eventually driven back to the woods. 5,000 men were killed, wounded or missing, a third of total strength. Back in Ulster, Unionists contrasted what they saw as their self-sacrifice in the war for civilization in 1916, including four Victoria Crosses on the Somme, with the Judas-like stab in the back perpetrated at Easter in Dublin. For Nationalists and Unionists, 1916 was a year of blood sacrifice, but the bloodshed drove them further apart. The Easter Rising and the first day of the psalm would become vivid, emotive emblems of the rival ideologies. All changed, changed utterly, Yeats marvelled in his poem, Easter 1916. A terrible beauty is born. As soon as the war was over, Nationalists in Ireland, like those in Central Europe, seized their chance. Sinn Féin proclaimed an independent Irish Republic in January 1919, just as the peace conference opened in Paris. Sinn Féin's leader was Eamon de Valera, one of the few top figures from the 1916 Easter Rising still alive. Tall, gangling, austere, Dev was a complex figure, deeply religious, fanatical about rugby, passionate above all for a free Ireland. Sinn Féin argued that Ireland should be treated like Czechoslovakia and other new nations whose freedom had been approved by the Paris Peace Conference. But the British government refused to grant Ireland more than home rule within the United Kingdom. So Sinn Féin had to win Irish independence by force. And the result was a brutal paramilitary campaign. But all the bloodshed resolved nothing. So the British made a dramatic U-turn granting dominion status to the 26 counties of the South. This put them on a par with countries like Canada and Australia, running most of their own affairs, yet still in the British Empire. But the six counties of Ulster remained within the United Kingdom. The incomplete victory split Ireland's nationalist movement and led to a 10-month civil war. During that civil war, more Irish people died than in the War of Independence against Britain. What was left after the traumatic convulsions of post-war nationalism was a bitter, divided Ireland, partitioned between the Irish Free State and Northern Ireland. This was an invented mini-state, nominally run from Belfast, but in reality, dependent on London for funding and security. In Northern Ireland, as in Teshin, no neat dividing line could be drawn on the ground between rival ethnic groups. In working-class areas of Belfast, the two communities often lived in adjacent streets. The Protestant majority quickly took a firm hold. Ulster Unionists redrew constituency boundaries to their political advantage and did their best to keep Catholics out of the police and civil service. In Ulster, one ethnic and religious group was restricting the rights of another in order to keep itself on top. This 
was a familiar story on the continent of Europe, as in Masaryk's Czechoslovakia. These kind of tactics usually worked in the short term, but they stored up huge problems for the future. Ulster would eventually face its day of reckoning, but in the 1930s, it was Czechoslovakia that came to the boil. The crisis had its origins in the fallout from the Great War. Post-war Czechoslovakia contained some three million ethnic Germans, nearly a quarter of the population. They lived mostly in the northwest of the country, in places like Kadan, around the Sudeten Mountains. During the Habsburg era, these Germans had run the empire, but now the former top dogs were second-class citizens. Through a series of land reforms, Masaryk's Czechoslovakia broke up the large, German-owned estates in the Sudetenland. Jezerzy was the ancestral seat of one such German aristocratic family, the Lobkowitzes. They were hardly troublemakers. In 1918, Max Lobkowitz declared allegiance to the new republic despite being stripped of his title of prince. But by 1924, even Lobkowitz was writing to Masaryk to complain that the director of the regional land office was putting pressure on him. He wanted Lobkowitz to replace the German manager of his estates and his German head forester with Czechs. Just one example of the new order. Masaryk's lieutenant, Edward Benesch, told a British diplomat bluntly that the hardline policy of Czechification was intended to teach the Germans a lesson. Before the war, he said, they were here and we were there. But now, we are here and they are there. But the Sudeten Germans did not intend to stay there. And unlike the other disaffected minorities of Czechoslovakia, in the 30s they found a big power to protect them. Adolf Hitler played up the treatment of Sudeten Germans, using stories of persecution like the Kadan massacre as justification for bringing the Sudetenland into the German Reich. Britain and France let him do so in the now infamous Munich Pact. German troops marched in and the Czechoslovak government, now led by Edvard Benesch, fell. The crisis was an early step towards a second and even more terrible world war. Hitler was determined to redraw the map of Europe ratified here at Versailles. At first he did so slyly, playing the nationalist card against the peacemakers and claiming, as over the Sudetenland, that he just wanted to bring all Germans into Germany. But eventually, it became clear that Hitler dreamed of a racially pure Germany dominating all of Europe and eliminating the lesser races. His version of nationalism was truly demonic. Hitler nearly got what he wanted. By the time he shot himself in 1945, 50 million people had died, sacrificial victims on the altar of paranoid nationalism. Them against us, 
us against them. After the Second World War, Europeans still struggled with the question of nationalism. In some Eastern European countries, one response was to get rid of the nationalities. Population transfer so that states would no longer have troublesome minority groups. What we would now call ethnic cleansing. Five days before our victory in Europe, the Czechoslovakians went to work on the Germans. There was victory in the air, and they knew it. This was how Benesch and his people got their revenge for World War II. The German occupation had been brutal. And in 1945, the Czechs turned not only on the German army, but on the ethnic Germans who lived within their borders. Some were held in fortresses such as this one, Terezin, formerly the brutal SS concentration camp of Theresienstadt. Temporary wartime home to some 150,000 Jews, en route to Auschwitz and other Nazi extermination camps. Theresienstadt was an old Habsburg garrison town symbol of an empire that hung together because its people were allowed several identities. But after 1918, identity became an either-or question, most appallingly in Hitler's Aryan or nothing ideology. And after 1945, Benesch's Czechoslovakia made its own either-or decision. You couldn't be German and Czechoslovak. More than two million Germans were driven out of the country between 1945 and 1950. And now a new empire, the Soviet Union, was taking a grip on Czechoslovakia and most of Eastern Europe. It demanded that national identity be subsumed in socialist internationalism, as defined by the Kremlin. When nationalist independence movements exploded in Budapest in 1956 and Prague in 1968, Moscow cracked down hard. In Eastern Europe, the Soviets tried to submerge nationalism. But in Western Europe, a remarkable group of men, still scarred by the Great War, came up with a very different solution to the challenges of nationalism, much more creative, and one that still defines Europe to the present day. It's really rather appropriate that the founding father of the European Union has a roundabout named after him here in the heart of Europe, Brussels, because his life sums up the bizarre merry-go-round of national identity in the first half of the 20th century. When war broke out in 1914, Robert Schumann was a lawyer practicing in German-controlled Lorraine, and he was nearly conscripted into the German army. After the Great War, when France recovered Alsace and Lorraine, Schumann became a French citizen and got into French politics. During the Second War, he served in the wartime resistance before becoming France's foreign minister. This turbulent early life highlighted for Schumann the limits of hard-line nationalism, the cycle of wars and revenge between France and Germany. As he put it, If one does not want to fall back into the same old errors when dealing with the German problem, then there is only one solution, and that is a European solution. In other words, the issue was no longer them and us, more like, if you can't beat them, join them. 
That was essentially the message of the Schuman Plan, which called on France, Germany and their neighbours to give up national control over their coal and steel industries. Coal and steel were double-edged, essential for industrial growth, but also vital tools of war making. If France and Germany gave up their national sovereignty over these key assets, it would make a new conflict between the two old enemies impossible. Schumann's coal and steel community was a first step to the Treaty of Rome in 1957, which created the European Economic Community. The growing bond between France and Germany was cemented by the rapport between two other veterans of the Great War era, French President Charles de Gaulle and the German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer. De Gaulle had spent half of the Great War in German prisoner of war camps. Ardenau's first visit to Paris had been to see the German delegation just before it had to sign the Treaty of Versailles. But against all the odds, the two men got on really well. In 1962, in a moving and intensely symbolic moment, the two leaders took mass here in Reims Cathedral. This was the sacred coronation place of French kings and also site of one of Germany's most notorious cultural atrocities of 1914, when the shelling of the cathedral had helped define the destructive Hun in popular imagination. Less than two decades on from 1945, France and Germany, these age-old enemies, were finally emerging from the shadows cast by the Great War and its successor. This was an astonishing turnaround. Nowhere was there more astonishment than in London. For Britain, national sovereignty had worked during the Second World War. So in the 1950s, the British view was that European integration was OK, but for them, not us. By the time Britain changed its mind and finally joined the European community in 1973, the EEC had been in operation for 15 years. By then, the original European deal-making had set firm, requiring Britain to accept arrangements like the common agricultural policy that did not really fit its economic interests. And so Britain became the perpetual awkward partner inside Europe, but not feeling European. Britain's shift in focus in the 1960s from empire to Europe encouraged the Dominions to go their own way. In Australia, Labour leaders like Paul Keating claim Britain simply walked out on us and joined the common market. Another legacy of the Great War was now becoming positively toxic. 1966 was the 50th anniversary of the Easter Rising in Ireland. In Dublin, the old rituals were still observed. De Valera, aged 83 and almost blind, but clinging to power as President of Ireland, addressed gatherings of veterans from 1916. And the past still echoed into the present, because for hardline nationalists, the battle for independence was still not over. The Brits remained in control of the North. 
To highlight their case, in April 1966, 70,000 nationalists paraded along the Falls Road. A colour party carried the Irish tricolour, followed by large banners with etchings of the executed leaders of 1916. Hardline Protestants denounced this as a betrayal of the faith and the union. They took to the streets and to the pulpit. I'm a free-born Protestant, and all the intimidation, and all the slander, and all the lying about me will not stop me in my campaign in Ulster to keep Ulster out of the side of Ireland. The Reverend Ian Paisley led a countermarch of Protestant loyalists and a service here in the Ulster Hall, a unionist shrine. The service was intended as an act of thanksgiving for the defeat in 1916 of what Paisley called a papist German plot to stab England in the back in time of war. For Paisley, the nationalist celebrations of the Easter Rising were an insult to our constitution. As tension mounted, 1916 cast a second shadow over Ireland. The 1st of July 1966 was the 50th anniversary of the sacrifice of the Ulster Division on the first day of the Somme. Paisley again brought his supporters out onto the streets, sparking violent clashes with Catholics and nationalists. The Troubles in Northern Ireland officially started in October 1968, when police and civil rights marchers clashed in Derry. But the long shadow of the Great War also played its part. What's important to realise is that an essential catalyst of the Troubles was the rival rhetoric and competing reenactments of 1916. 50 years on for new generations in North and South. Each side was using history for its own ends. By the 1970s, Ireland seemed almost to have returned to the Great War era, with the British Army back on the streets and cycles of tit-for-tat violence. In 30 years of the Troubles, some 3,500 people would be killed. Only in the 1990s, with the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement, did the Irish begin to transcend the rival sagas of 1916. The new Island of Ireland Peace Tower in Belgium commemorated the sacrifice of Irish Catholics as well as Ulster Protestants in Britain's Great War. In Eastern Europe too, the Great War settlement was finally coming apart. After being frozen for years, during the Cold War. As the Soviets withdrew from Czechoslovakia, friction between the Czech and Slovak lands intensified. The state, fabricated by Thomas Masaryk in 1918, split into two republics. The town of Tyshin is still divided, now between Poland and the new, smaller Czech Republic. Tensions between the nationalities remain, but both are subsumed within a modern form of empire, the European Union, as they had been a century ago under the Habsburg Empire. The EU may seem bureaucratic and intrusive, but within its ponderous structures, the beast of nationalism, which had ravaged Europe for most of the 20th century, is finally being tamed. While nationalism was being contained on the continent, the United Kingdom was out of sync again. The Britain that fought the war was straining apart. The Great War had 
rekindled a sense of Britishness in Scotland and also in Wales. But that began to wane by the 1990s as the unifying force of the two world wars and the Cold War receded into history. In 1997, Scotland and Wales finally gained home rule, and the Scottish National Party manoeuvred its way to a full-scale referendum on independence in 2014. Friends, we are Scotland's independence generation, and our time, our time is now. Nationalist sentiment against Europe also escalated with the rise of the UK Independence Party. Membership of the European Union has never been very popular on the English side of the channel. Yet the task of disentangling the British us from the continental them would be immense. The British were reluctant Europeans in 1914 and remain so today. Victory in the Great War came at enormous cost. The dead left Britain with a sense of wariness about Europe, a feeling which the rest of the 20th century served only to deepen. In this, as in so many ways, the Great War still casts a long shadow.